Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on 7.5 acres out in the country. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's less than a third of an acre. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want you to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, what, when, where, how. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hey, Carol, how is your garden this week? You know what? I'm feeling pretty much on top of things, so to speak, maybe, possibly. I mean, I got a few things done. Mm -hmm. I got the garden commission done. Remind me what that was for you. Well, my garden commission was to get all my fall bulbs planted. Okay. And you had 500 Kyanodoxa, but it looks like you had more because you went back and bought more. Well, yeah, I, so Saturday was a beautiful day, and it was sunny, and I thought, this is the day. We've had two-plus inches of rain. The ground's ready. I'm going to plant the 500 cone of doxa bulbs. So I opened the box, and I kept taking out packages, and I thought, this, this seems like more than 500. <laughs> so in some uh, subconscious state or whatever, I ordered a thousand Kyanodoxa bulbs. Well, that'll be really pretty next spring. And I don't think anything eats those. So that's a good choice. Cause right now, yeah, I have an armadillo digging up my front yard. Freaking armadillo, but we won't even talk about that. Okay. So we don't have those. Oh, I'm, you're a lucky. We used to not either, but it's gotten warmer. So hey. people ask me how I plant these in the lawn. And so I have this thing called a rockery trowel, which is kind of sharp on the end. I stab it in the ground, pull it back, drop the bulb in, do that a thousand times, and you're done. Normally, I get a big blister, but the people from Diggs Gloves, Mm D-I-G-Z, sent me gloves to try. Right. And I grabbed this one pair that swayed on the palm and had some padding, and uh, I used those, and Son of a gun, I didn't get a blister. So we're going to link to the Diggs gloves because I think I'm getting some too, but I haven't. I think I responded after you did. Um, If you had an armadillo, he could dig all the little holes for you because that's exactly what they do. They dig little shallow holes just right for a cryonodoxa or those little tommies, the crocus, and then they don't put back the grass. So I go outside and find my grass turned upside down and little holes all over my yard. It's delightful. So what are you going to do? So anyway, I I did that, and that's my garden commission. I got a new commission for myself. I love having garden commissions because, honestly, I might have lazed out all Saturday if I hadn't known that I had to report back to you and to our listeners. (laughs) That works so well for your personality type. And so if people Uh people don't already know, Carol is all about lists and getting things done, and her friend Dee is the complete opposite, and the more garden commissions you give me, the less likely I am to do it. It's just my oh, rebellious personality. Yeah. So tell me. No, I'm not going to tell so you we, what we're going to do to the armadillo. It ain't going to be pretty. Okay. Well, tell me what you did in your garden this past week. I went up and cut the meadow because I knew this big front was coming through, and we're recording this on a Monday to be published on a Wednesday. And right now it's 32 degrees outside, which is really cold for October in Oklahoma. And we have rain and kind of the sleet. And then the western part of the state, we have snow and ice, which is a bummer. But by tomorrow, it's all supposed to float down here. But that's the perfect time to go mow down your meadow and then throw out all your seeds, which is what I did. Was that my garden commission? Because I don't even remember. Well, you know what? Just so you can... Have something checked off a list, yeah. which you don't like. We're going to call that your garden commission. Good. I'm glad to hear it. I also planted bulbs. I'm looking back at our notes to see if I actually did my garden commission. Um, I, I, I did my bulbs. I haven't gotten very many yet, but there's more coming. And I'm going to try something new this year with my hyacinths in pots. Want to hear? Yes. So when I read Uprooted, she takes her hyacinths, put them out, puts them outside, in her uh, cold frames 
And then she covers them. You know, she closes the cold frame because it's colder where she lives. I left my cold frame partially open so that they would still get cooled off, right, and get their cooling period. But also yes. they'll keep the rain off of them because once you water them, she doesn't water hers anymore until they start to grow because she doesn't want them to rot. And that's a very smart thing. So I'm going to give that a try. Um, okay, so my garden commission was easy for this week. I was supposed to keep watering my plant cuttings and replace any that died before we got a freeze. And I have been doing that. So there you go. We're going to have to up your game. We're going to have to up your game, Dee. Hey, girl, I did a lot this week. <laughs> okay. Well, the other thing that I did is my sister had a few days off work, and she ordered a bunch of bulbs. So I went over there to help her place them, and we put them all in this one garden area by her front front of her house. Right. And so she hands me, she had 30 big tulips. Oh, nice. And she says, where should I put these? So there were two types. I mixed them up in a bucket, and then I started tossing them onto the flower bed. Sure. She says, what are you doing? I says, we're randomly placing them. I says, wherever they fall, you plant them. That's good. And then we mixed up all her smaller bulbs, and I said, now just scatter these all around. I says, believe me, it's going to be beautiful in the spring. It is. Because she was going to row up her tulips like soldiers, no. and that is not right. Well, it just doesn't look natural. I mean, people can plant them any way they want to, as far as I'm concerned, but it doesn't look as natural as that style, and I love that style. So you can... I do too, and she's going to love it. We aren't planting tulips here now. I mean, it's too early. We do it around Thanksgiving. So just for people in Oklahoma and Texas, yeah. But first of all, if you're going to try to grow tulips with our voles, God love you. But um, I've gotten to where I just put them in pots now. Now, I do have friends up at, by Tulsa that they are ardent tulip people. And so they do it every year. But I don't always do it. Well, that's good. We can plant them now in Indianapolis and up in Zone 6 and 5 and where we're at. We can plant all the bulbs. All the bulbs. So we finally got some rain in Oklahoma, thank God. It's been so, we did so too. dry, and you got rain, so everything is good, except for I love our topic this week. Our topic this week is about um, when your garden gets scary, because this is going to yes. come out right before Halloween, and we always try to do a little Halloween thing. Well, did we do last year yes, Halloween? Yes, we did. I can't remember. We did do Halloween okay. last year. All right. We'll do our quote, and let's get started. May jack-o'-lanterns burning bright of soft and golden hue pierce through the future's veil and show what fate now holds for you. By goblins of the cornfield stark, by witches dancing on the green, by pumpkins grinning in the dark, I wish you luck this Halloween. It's a postcard from the early 1900s. I loved it. Oh, that is so neat. Oh, cute and spooky. So there is stuff that people are afraid of in the garden, you know. Yeah, I get I get asked about this stuff all the time, and we came up with lots of things that are moderately scary. Yeah, like people are afraid of deadheading. They're afraid of pruning, and they're afraid of deadheading, both. Yes, they are. And really, that's the best thing you can do for so many plants. Yes, it is, because in the spring, you know— We've already talked about this in April, but in April, May, you need to cut back all your mums and asters and things like that because they get out of control. And so that's cutting back. And then there's pruning. And I think people are afraid of pruning because they're afraid they're going to prune at the wrong time. Right. And so my sister texted me and said, should I cut back my roses? I'm like, not till spring. Yeah. At this point, don't cut back your roses anymore, but you can deadhead them all spring and summer and in Oklahoma, I actually deadhead them all the way through August, beginning of September, because usually we don't get much cold until the end of October, and they get one more bloom. And one thing about roses that I think people should remember is if you're going to be on a garden tour, prune your roses, I mean deadhead your roses, one month before the tour, and your roses will be in bloom for the tour, at least in my state, because I do it all the time. Huh. Well, I haven't done that because I've not been on a tour and I don't have a bunch of roses anyway. I think the other thing people are afraid of is to make a nice big flower bed or border. They tend to make things really narrow and small and not give the plants a bunch of room or maybe afraid they're not going to be able to Maintain plant it. everything. Mm -hmm. Bigger is better, Dee. Bigger is better. <laughs> when it comes to gardening, bigger is better for sure. 
Um, I say go ahead and, you know, spade up that bed if you want to or layer stuff on it to kill whatever's in there. I have to dig out beds because of the Bermuda grass, but then I layer a bunch of leaves on top, shredded leaves. That's true. The, well, which is the other thing, don't be afraid to leave leaves kind of on your flower beds and stuff. It's not going to be terrible. People it, think that they have to yeah. clean sweep their garden and they don't. They don't have to clean sweep it, but in where I live, where it's really, really dense woods, I know people think in Oklahoma we don't have dense woods, but we do, starting east of I-35. Well, all of those woods are oak leaves. <laughs> They're oak trees. And those oak trees have really fibrous leaves that are super tough. So you do want to get those off of your fescue lawn if you have a fescue lawn. And you also probably want to get them off your beds. And then just run over them with a mulching mower and then you can put them back on. They just have to be able to break down. Yeah, that's the thing. If you And I've been mowing and mulching up leaves and they're broken, you know, into little pieces. And I'm putting back on the beds and stuff. So in another couple of weeks, I'll probably blow out a bunch of the leaves that are on the flower beds. And mm-hmm. like you said, I'll mulch them up and then put them right back. Yeah, and it, uh, another thing people are afraid of that I got a lot this past week when I was doing a lot of garden coaching is they're afraid they're going to kill plants. And they are going to kill plants. Get over it. Yeah, it's okay. In fact, my dog, my silly dog, he dug up, Pup Francis dug up my newly planted garden bed like three or four times. And he's dug up the plants, and I stick them back down there, and I know I'm going to lose a couple of plants because I don't see them in time. And if those roots get dried out, that plant's gone. But you know what? They sell that plant for $5 at Bustani Plant Farm. I will just go buy another one. And by then, things will be bigger, and when they're bigger, he doesn't dig them up. He's just really bad about digging up small in any, any area that's new. Oh, my sister's got a new dog that got last fall. This dog has completely dug up their backyard to the point they had to bring in topsoil to repair it. And so she, she sent me another task and text, and she says, is it too late to sow grass seed? And I'm like, it's about too late, but if you have some seed, put it down. And I'm like, you got to put down some straw because that dog's just going to bring mud in all mm-hmm. winter long because they had almost had to completely redo anyway. The other thing I would say is don't be afraid to hire professional help if you need it. And in this case, your sister needs professional help because, and she also needs to put a collar on that dog with one of those little radio, you know, the little radio collars and put a perimeter around her yard so he will quit digging up that one spot. Golly. Well, no, he dug up the whole backyard. What they need to do is put a collar on that dog. And when the dog has to go outside, somebody's got to go out with the dog on a leash or build a dog. Let it do its business. And then bring it back inside. Yeah, yeah, that oh, that makes sense. So you're telling me it could be worse. Okay, so another thing people worry about, especially on roses, are the prickles, which we commonly call thorns. You don't have to worry so much about thorny plants. Just be respectful of them. You know, wear gloves. In fact, if you're really worried about, if you have a lot of roses, I would get some rose gloves. They have leather gauntlets. They're kind of like beekeeping gloves, both to keep from getting hurt. <laughs> I always feel like I'm... Um, like a medieval knight when I put on those rose pruning gloves, because I have some. I don't know why. Because I have like two roses. So, <laughs> of course, I had to have the gauntlet gloves. I feel like a medieval knight. Well, it certainly it certainly gives a whole new picture to throwing down the gauntlet, you know, like the medieval uh-huh. knights. Now you see, they weren't just throwing down a glove. They were throwing down a big old giant glove with leather on the edges. And they went, wham, I, you know, challenged oh, yeah. you to a duel. Anyway, I don't intend to challenge anybody to a duel, but don't fear thorns, don't fear weeds, don't fear overgrown beds. Just one little step at a time, you can get them back in order and ask for help if you need it. Exactly. So we hope people do not fear gardening. I mean, it's no fun if you're afraid or timid. Go out there boldly. Yes. Go out boldly in the garden, and you know what? You can't screw it up too bad, and don't worry about it. You can always email us if you do screw it up. Because we'll help you. All right. Speaking of fears, let's go. The next quote. I'll do th- You want to do it? You do it. The next time you see a spider web, please pause and look a little closer. You'll be seeing one of the most high performance materials known to man. That's by Cheryl Hayashi. 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 Mm-hmm. So I looked up Cheryl Hayashi. Dr. Hayashi. She's a Hawaiian born biologist and she's director of this big thing called comparative biology, biology research, but she has a great Ted talk and the Ted talk is on spiders and silk. 
And she said, I, I watched the whole TED Talk, and she literally studies all these different spiders, how they make silk, the types of silk in their webs, which I didn't realize it, but a common garden spider, good old, is it a gryope? I don't know. I think so. The one that makes the zipper, zipper spiders. People are terrified of them and they will not hurt us, but they spin at least seven different types of silk in their spider webs, that common spider. And so I just thought it was really cool and people are afraid of spiders in the garden and they really shouldn't be. I mean, if you run into a black widow in your garage, well, I can understand dispatching those, but um, don't worry about the common garden spider. It's a friend in the garden. It kills a lot of bugs. Yes, it does. And here's the thing. I found an article, coincidentally, off a newsletter of another article about spider webs and why they decorate their webs with those zigzaggy parts. And that zigzaggy part has a name. Right. Yes, you put it in here and you're going to pronounce it. Stabilimentum. Stabilimentum. So does that stabilize their web? Is that why they put the zipper? There's like, if you read the article, and we'll put a link to it, there's like seven... Uh, hypotheses as to what that zipper part is for, whether it's stability or to attract a mate or I don't know. Attract a bug attract, to eat. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of stuff. So so I take, um, one year I had this huge zipper spider and she built a web and it's always, it's the she, it's the female ones that are great big that have the long legs that look like they're wearing high heels. The males are small. But anyway, she was in my garden and it was fall. And I walked out there and picked off stink bugs and I would throw them into her web every once in a while just to help her out. I really enjoyed that. I hate stink bugs. They eat my tomatoes. And so let's talk about scary things in the vegetable garden. And we think that there are scary insects other than spiders. There's, we should not be spared. We might be startled by the spiders, but we shouldn't be as afraid of the spiders. Right, so you don't have to hate them. No. So big orb spiders, they show up, you know, they show up in between your tomato plants or they string their webs between things, so you might accidentally walk into it. But they're really helpful in your garden. Yeah, I have done that. Yeah, me too. I have too. But that's okay. They won't hurt you. But let's talk about other scary things like hornworms. Hornworms are scary. Okay, so hornworms are not that scary. They look scary, but they don't sting you like a stinging caterpillar. And you can just pull them off one tomato plant and just sacrifice one plant in your garden. Or you can cut them if you want to, but they make um, sphinx moths, a a variety of sphinx moth. And it depends on which hornworm you have, which variety of sphinx moth you get. Does that make sense? It does. And the whole thing is reminding me that there's um, a caterpillar, a woolly worm that shows up in the fall that's actually mm-hmm. poisonous. And uh-huh. people think it looks like something that's pettable. But and then they end, it end, they end up with huge, big blisters from it. And I heard something on the radio that out in Virginia, I think, they've just had, I don't want to say hordes, but an inordinate an number. An, yeah. yeah, an inordinate number of these caterpillars and people are touching them and then ending up in the ER. It's horrible. Ooh, don't don't touch those. Any fuzzy caterpillar, just don't touch it. Even though it looks sweet, it might not be sweet. So, but you can pick off hornworms. You're not going to hurt anything. But look at them closely before you pick them off your plants, because a lot of times you'll see these little egg sacs on their backs, and that those are wasps that are getting ready to eat that hornworm from the inside out. And that's Mother Nature taking care of your garden for you. Not unlike spiders, right? But exactly. speaking of blisters. Do you have blister beetles in your garden? You know what? I don't think that I probably oh do, my. but I have never encountered a blister beetle in the way that perhaps you have. Yeah, they're black and they're small. They look like little Halloween creatures. Um, and I used to just squish stuff with my fingers. And one year I squished blister beetles because I didn't know what they were. I was young and gardening. I didn't know. Anyway, I squished them and I'll be doggone it. They, I had blisters for a month. Now, it, they didn't hurt. They itched like a son of a gun later. But don't squish them with your fingers. Don't do what I did. The other thing is um, they don't do that much damage to your plants. So if you want to, you know, shake them off into a can of soapy water, you can. Or you can just leave them alone. I had them on one tomato plant this year. I do not think that I've had blister beetles. I make it a habit not to really squash any bugs because you just never know. 
That's probably a good thing to think. I don't do it anymore since the blister beetles. So that's our scary, scary part of the vegetable garden. Right. So we have a book that's not scary, but fits our Halloween theme. It's beautiful. It's called Black Plants, 75 Striking Choices for the Garden. Hey, who wrote that book, Dee? You know what? I I will look it up because I don't remember right off the top of my head. You keep going and I will look it. Oh, Paul Bonine is what it says. I didn't know Paul Bonine wrote it. But anyway, uh, it's all about black plants, which actually black plants aren't black. They're really dark purple. And so we were going to each pick out one black plant we really love or maybe more. Right. And so I picked, I don't really have that many black plants, but I really love that clematis I told you about called yep. Sirius Black that disappeared on me. Oh, I really love that plant. Enough. And maybe I need to buy it again. Maybe you do. And so I actually love black plants and use them a lot in my garden. And I love the big, dark colocagias, the elephant ears, like black magic or black coral. I like a lustrous, which is black with uh, green veining. And so it's really pretty with black magic. And I can't, I can't talk about black pan- plants without talking about black hellebores. And on the front of this book is a black hellebore. Yes, and it's beautiful. And uh, this, I mean... It almost looks black, and we know it's dark, 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 dark purple. But they're very cool. The only thing about hellebores is if you have to grow them in the shade like we do here, the black ones don't show up very well in the shade, but they still are really, really pretty. And then you were also going to talk, we we talked last week about peppers, ornamental peppers, and there's one that you really like that has black leaves. Yeah, the onyx red we talked about has black leaves. But looking in this book... We talked about Cosmos last week, and there's a chocolate Cosmos. I grew it one year. And uh, it's really dark. And there are also some dahlias. Bishop of Landauf and, um, has really dark leaves and bright red flowers. And then mm-hmm. Karma Chocolate has dark leaves and really dark flowers. Yeah, and honestly, this book came out. I'm going to look and see when it came out. It came out a little while back, and I think at this point... They could um, actually update this book again because there's a lot more black plants than just the ones that they currently have in the book. I didn't yeah. see where it was when it was this, published, but it's in a little. This bit. came out in 2009, so it's been a while. So they could actually bring out a newer book that has even more black plants. But you get the idea. Black plants are beautiful. They are, and you know what they look. I love when they pair really dark black plants with chartreuse colored foliage. I love that contrast. Oh, yeah. That's what well, you would love um, black magic elephant ears with illustrious because that's kind of what it looks like because the veining in illustrious is really, really bright green. So do we have anything else to say about the book? Uh, that we like it and we both have it kind of on our shelves as a, a reference book of sorts. It's not a huge book. No, it's a small it's, book. But it just gives you a lot of good ideas and you think, you know what, I could... Some people have a white garden where they get all like white flowers and stuff. A lot of people have a white garden. Why don't you have a black garden instead? Yeah, I'm going to have with black flowers. Yeah, white gardens got really popular because of Sissinghurst. But, you know, it's time to... I, I really get distressed when somebody tells me they want me to help them put in a white garden. Anyway, I think it's been overdone. It has so, been overdone. Shall we move on? We shall. And I'm going to do the quote. Okay. There is a child in every one of us who is still a trick-or-treater looking for a brightly lit front porch. Robert Brault from his website. Um, I thought that that was the best little quote about, I think everybody does have that child inside of them. That's why people love Halloween. You don't get trick-or-treaters at where you are, do you? No, but I just go visit friends and sit on their front porches and see their trick-or-treaters. Here in my neck of the woods... They are really discouraging trick-or-treaters, you know, because of the, the COVID. Yeah, I think um, I think here we are doing trick-or-treating. I mean, after all, kids wear masks anyway, and they're just encouraging people not to let kids put their hands in the bowl of candy and handing the candy to them with gloves on. So we're going to do it here. It's an outdoor activity, and I'm glad we're still doing it. 
And here, actually, I probably won't be home. <laughs> oh, man, what a curmudgeon you are. <laughs> One of those people. Oh, well, be sure and turn off your light. They will be off. Nobody's going to. There's only like, there's like three little boys in the neighborhood that could possibly trick or treat. So I'm not worried about it. Okay. But let's, well, I wouldn't worry let's about talk it. about our dirt. Our dirt is a favorite Halloween story. Yes. <laughs> and I recall an episode of Night Gallery called yes. Green Fingers, which is on YouTube. So we're going to put a link, but it's that little old lady that the land developer is trying to get her to give up her property. Yeah. She won't do it. And so they try to kill her off, but she keeps saying, everything I plant grows, even me. Well, so don't give it keeps, away. Don't give it all away. Well, <laughs> maybe our listeners anyway. I mean, they might want to go watch it. Yeah, I'll, we'll put the link on there. It's on YouTube. <laughs> everything I plant grows, even me. <laughs> <laughs> You have a pretty good laugh for that. Um, and in my case, I like an old Twilight episode, Twilight Zone episode called The Hunt. And Carol didn't think it was gardeny enough, but in my, here's why I think it's gardeny. I thought it was spooky as all get out. And it's about an old man, and he's walking with his hunting dog through meadows. And so, therefore, in my case, it's gardeny enough. Because if he's walking through meadows, it's wildflowers. And that's all I'm going to tell about it. You guys should go see those two episodes. They're spooky and they're fun. And then I, I wrote a blog post that I'm going to link to. I mean, I wrote this thing, I think, in 2008. And I keep thinking I'll get my nephew to do up the illustrations and turn it into a children's book. But I made up this Halloween hair. I remember your Halloween around. hair. Yeah. It, it hops around from garden to garden on Halloween night. And if the garden's a big mess... And he doesn't find any Easter candy left over in the lawn, then he makes the garden a bigger mess. So, oh, so he's rude. Unlike the Christmas cottontail. Unlike the Christmas cottontail. So he's looking for leftover Easter candy. So, but he'll take Halloween candy. So I always tell people throw some Halloween candy out in the lawn for the Halloween hair, so that the Halloween hair doesn't destroy your garden looking for candy. I think you should turn that into a story. I think that'd be cute. Well we'll, so well, we'll link to it and see what our readers, th- our listeners think. Sounds good. So that's it. We got a garden commission. I've got a garden commission for myself. Okay, you definitely have one, but apparently I gave myself the same one as last week. So I must be worried about those cuttings. Uh, you must house. be. Um, I think I gave my, I don't think I gave myself this commission, but this is the week to pull out all the old zinnias and the old marigolds Get those, I'm going to put those in the trash because the zinnias often have powdery mildew. I don't want that to continue. And marigolds often end up this late in the season with spider mites. Yeah, they do. We get spider mites here pretty pretty soon, actually. Um, I'll keep watering my cuttings, and I will clear out the rest of my vegetable garden. All right, I'm going to hold you to that. But we're not going to make it a checklist, Dee, because, you know, you don't like checklists. You're making fun of me again. We're just going to make that a gentle suggestion for you. <laughs> I'm already starting to get my back up, Carol. But anyway. All right. Well, before before things get completely out of control, we want to thank everyone for listening to The Garden Angelus. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. Also, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we are in a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the Garden Gate today. Bye until next week. Bye.